Good morning, Chuck. Good morning, Lori. Welcome that was to a, a long start to get the recording going. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are live. <clears throat> and we're live and ready to go. So. And this uh, is Student Manager 101, the part two of five courses. We're ready to roll. Big, big deal. Big, big deal about courses. So if you want to let me let me rock and roll, we'll get this show on the road. So There you go. The con is yours, Scotty. And I'm waiting for it to appear. There it is. Gosh, I hope we have better response time than that. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> we're here to talk about courses, all things related to the class, the, co the course record in Student Manager. Now, one of the things that we want to do is, uh, well, we got, first of all, this is a 90-minute session. Uh, we're going to aim to have uh, discussion or questions at the end. <clears throat> these, are kind, this, these are kind of the schedule that we're going to follow. Uh, we will have a, a live example of a class. So we will try to get uh, to where we'll, uh, we'll kind of preview what's going to happen and then get into actual creating a course and hopefully cover all the details. Uh, Lori, again, uh, feel free to come in with a comment or a note or you, your observation if there's something you think I'm missing as we go through this. So let's, uh, the course screen, uh, again, uh, the course title and the code are honestly the only required field that you need in a course screen. Uh, technically, you can build a course, and we'll talk about the types in a minute, uh, without anything else. <clears throat> uh, there are a number of validated fields. Validated fields are ones where you'll see a little drop down next to them. And basically, uh, a number of fields are like that. And again, the purpose of that is to help you get proper data entry. And again, if you are a user with a four or higher level, you'll have the option to create. You'll see a plus button there. And you'll have an option to create codes within those areas. Usually that's something that's done by your system admin or your chief um, keeper of the flame is what we call the uh, administrator of ACEWARE student manager on your campus. Um, just a little bit of introduction, and we're going to get into details, but I want to talk about the big picture. The course is critically important because it drives so many things within your program. All of the options for a registration are tied to the class. There are some system level settings, which we'll show you. But a lot of the detail, the fees, the location, when and where, the numbers, how many there are in the class, uh, the hours you get, the CEUs you get, those all are set by how you define the class. So again, um, it is a big deal, uh, and, and we'll hopefully give you a good orientation of that. I know a number of you have been uh, uh, in the system a long time. Uh, the, this is the 7.2a version. Honestly, on the course, there aren't a lot of changes, but we're going to cover it kind of from the get-go, from the beginning. So hopefully you will be at least reminded that you're doing the right thing, <clears throat> or we'll try to make sure you're not missing anything, even for you experienced folk. All right, active. This is a big deal because a lot of people tend to put more uh, emphasis on the active button than what it really is. The, the big deal about the active button on a course is that it means that this, this course is open for enrollment. That you as a staff member can then find this class when you go to add a registration on a student. And, and that's all it means. There is no magical reporting or no magical hiding or closing or hidden kind of behavior through the use of the active button. Um, and I'm not sure what the warning message was, Lori. Was there, I'm trying to recall on that. I meant to ask you that earlier. If you try to uh, register somebody in a class oh. that's not active, it comes up and says that yeah. it's not active. That's a right. message, yeah. Now, the other thing is this allows you to hide a class that have already started. Or if you're building classes like now for the spring term, but you don't want people enrolling in it, you don't want staff. And now again, we need to clarify. The active button 
only addresses issues related to student manager staff registration. Does not affect ACEWEB. ACEWEB has its own rules. So it's just for active registration. Here's the big deal. I'm going to roll over to the demo. If I'm in a name record and I go to add, a, I'm a registrar, and I go to add a registration, the goal, and this is important, when you are a registrar or if you're the person who is doing course setup, when your registrars go to a student and hit add registration, the only classes they should see in this list are classes that are upcoming classes that are contemporary, current, that are available for registration. So if you click on add registration on your database, your student manager, and you're seeing classes from 2011. So here are two that are bad in that they are not active. These are not at current courses. They should not be active, and they shouldn't be showing up on the list. The only classes that should be showing up are classes that are upcoming, open for enrollment. Now it will show, it will show a class that's full. <clears throat> so if you have a class maximum, uh, it'll still show up. It will warn you that the class is full and you can wait list people. But basically, a closed class, a class that's done, a class that you cancel, I'd recommend you always deactivate it. And again, that somehow seems to get uh, confusing for people. But that's, that's the deal about the active button. Um, there is a, uh, that, that button is, is, is a manual button. There is nothing automatic about changing that. So either you go in course by course, or there is a mass change option for activating and deactivating courses. And we'll show you briefly where that is at the end of the session. Typically, that is the job for your student manager, manager, your keeper of the flame on your campus. If that's you and you don't know how to do that, uh, we'll try to give you the go to help or go to your tech to make sure you've got the detail on that. All right. Uh, now, the next one, though, locked. A locked class does make uh, some big differences. You typically will lock a class when the class is completed, done, all the registrations are in, all the refunds are done, all transfers and edits are handled. And so again, locking a class prohibits anyone from changing any of the registration or payment data for that class. So again, not everybody uses Law Locked, but if you want to, if you want to basically hold a class static so that nobody changes it, that's what the lock does. <clears throat> um, hours and CEUs and credits. Again, um, you can turn these on and off. We'll talk about preferences in a minute. But again, uh, you would create in there uh, the 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 maximum permissible or the, the maximum that you're going to grant for that class. And the, the default behavior is that whenever someone registers, they earn those credits by default. It's kind of salvation by grace, if you would. And your role as a registrar is if a student strays, cancels, drops out, you would then deduct those hours or wipe those hours out. <clears throat> when they cancel or you, you do your final uh, removal of the class. Uh, subject code, big, big deal. Uh, if, uh, of all the fields to enter in the system, I really encourage you that you be adding a subject code to every class. And the, the reason for that is several fold. One is a, it's a good way to help you do some class uh, reporting by a category or a group. And the other thing is that it will automatically stamp on a name record in the name interest codes. And real quickly, I'm going to jump to a name record here. In the interest code area, whatever you have on the class for a subject code, when a student enrolls in that class, that subject code would be stamped into their interest code so that you know just looking at the student. This person is interested by having expressed interest or having taken a class in an ACEWARE class. Um, optional additional info tab. 
Uh, one of the things about the course screen is that you've got several different tabs on the course screen. Main, additional, fees, instructors, comments, ASWEB. Well, we're now into the second tab, which is additional information. Um, alternate course code, um, I don't know, there's not a many, but if you need to cross-reference your classes with perhaps a campus class, some of you who do credit programs, Northern Colorado, if you need to cross-reference your class with a PIN number or a CRN number from a campus credit class, this would be where you'd put it. Um, Special registration times. If you've got a conference or a symposia and you want to reference early, late registration times. <clears throat> email attachments. Uh, obviously, with the email module, you can send an email confirmation and include attachments. Now, note, best practice nowadays would be that rather than send an attachment with an email receipt, you embed in the email receipt body a link to the documents on your website. And the reason for that is that that helps you uh, hopefully improve deliverability of emails so that you're not fighting with uh, your spam traps on a person's email uh, with attachments. A uh, person to notify for blind carbon copy of an emailed uh, registration. <clears throat> for each class, you can add in three or four names of people who you might who might want to get a copy of every registration coming in. If it might be your coordinator for the class, it could be a program sponsor if you have a third party sponsor on this class. Again, that's an option class by class. The sponsoring firm, uh, this is particularly uh, relevant for contract classes <clears throat> and this links to the firm's table. And then finally, membership prerequisites uh, for you OSHA lifelong learning programs. Um, a lot of those programs require that you must be a member in order to even enroll in the class, not irrespective of fee breakdowns. So again, this is where the OLLI prerequisite uh, comes in. Uh, Lori, how are we doing? Any, any buzz we need to deal with? Nope, we're great so far. Screen changes staying up to date? They were a little slow to begin with, but it had improved. They're snapping in. OK. User-defined fields. <clears throat> now again, uh, all of the main course, all of the main screens in ACEWARE, Student Manager, Names, Course, Register, and Instructor, have user-defined fields where you, as a program, get to define what fields you want to, what data you want to store in the different fields. Uh, that is adjustable through the preferences. And speaking of preferences, uh, one of the big things for all of the screens in Student Manager is that you as a program get to choose what fields you're going to use on the screen. And then there is also a series of behaviors. Uh, there's a couple ones here. The idea whether you use a split location field or a single location field. Typically, programs that do conferences might do a single location. If you're doing more class programs where you're actually scheduling classes in buildings and rooms on a campus, you're going to use split location. <clears throat> so again, uh, preferences and setup capabilities are handled through uh, the course preferences screen. The right-hand side of this screen is where a lot of, again, preferences occur. So that's where, uh, again, if you're, especially new users, even if you're a system that's had ACEWARE student manager for a long time, if you are new to the system or you haven't gone back and rechecked your preferences, I would encourage you to do that because a lot of times there's a new preference that we've added through the upgrade process and you may not, you, have, you may have missed <clears throat> that there is now an option for you to, uh, Set up some different option. Uh, set up some different behavior related to your course screen. Okay, we're still in the course screen. Reminders about user-defined fields. Again, um, activation of the user-defined fields are user-specific. So, user by user can enable fields. Um, the actual labels themselves are colored blue 
anything blue on your preferences screen is global. So everybody, those are global for everybody in the system. Black items are the ones that are um, uh, user specific by each individual user. You can validate character <clears throat> and number fields in uh, the UDF by using a plus sign in the description. <clears throat> and we'll cover that in the codes webinar. I'm just curious, uh, raise your hand. We're going to wake you guys up. <clears throat> raise your hand if you're doing any validated user-defined fields. And if you don't know what that is, then keep your hand down. Raise your hand if you are using any validated user-defined fields. We've got a couple people doing that. Again, the, the idea about validation is again, so that you can restrict data entry to just specific uh, entries. Very good. Thank you, guys. All right, um, next one. You can display the contents of a UDF on the main tab in the course screen. Now, I'm going to jump back to manager here <clears throat> and get back to that. Uh, let's get back to a course screen, 12 Frank. Uh, and that is right here on the, uh, there, there's a little 30 character window that you have the ability to either show, you know, what, uh, now you can do what you want with it, uh, but you can either use it to show something from the user defined field, something from fees, actually any element from any of the other fields back in the record can be displayed for you so you can see it right at the front screen. All right, <clears throat> uh, fees, main fees. There are two types of fees on a course in Student Manager. One is a primary fee. Uh, you can create as many as you want. The individual has to pick one, or the registrar would pick one for the student. <clears throat> Optional fees or other fees, you can have an unlimited number of other fees an individual can pick some or none or multiples of the same. Uh, and there are different fee types or categories. Mandatory, which you can require to be a mandatory optional fee. A coupon fee, typically for discounts. An inventory tracking fee, if you wanted to track inventory on a uh, optional sales item, the sale of a book or the sale of a supply kit. And then the other, which would be the normal, just optional fee, additional lunch, additional uh, uh, parking pass, uh, a fee. And so that is on the fee side. We'll cover that a bit more when we get into an options. I do want to say one other thing about fees. Early bird, a couple more. Early bird fees. Uh, how many people use early bird fees right now? I'm going to show your hands out. Raise your hand if you're using early bird fees. All right, all right, we've got a few on there. And again, a big deal on early bird fees is the theory that by getting people a bit of a discount, you or, let, let, me, let me rephrase that, uh, or raising the regular fee. And, and again, the trick on this is a way to <clears throat> increase your fees is that you take the regular fees you're charging call those the early bird fee and set them up to expire two weeks, 14 days, 21 days before the start of the class, and then raise the, quote, regular fee. And that's a sneaky way to allow you to, uh, to raise your fee prices and yet still say, hey, we're giving you a break. We're, if you register early, you get the same price. The other thing that's new about fees, and this is in the new 7.2a, so this is a new feature is that in AceWeb, you could set up fees on a course that would automatically apply a percentage discount if the person put in a coupon code or, or picked a particular fee type. That now is supported in the student manager side. So you can have discount fee options that are percent discounts if you enter the amount as a negative as a percentage that is less than one dollar and that you call it C for coupon. <clears throat> you can automatically apply percentage discounts when you're doing registrations from student manager. That's new again in 7.2. All right, Lori, you doing good?
We're doing very well. <clears throat> All right. Instructors. Uh, we're now off to the third tab, the Instructor tab. Um, to start adding instructors to a new course, the plus button handles that. Uh, you actually, again, and when you pick the drop-down list, you can add a new instructor on the fly. Uh, each one of these instructors can have their own pay rate. And, of course, the payoff for you is that when you do the pay information, you're able to use the system to generate faculty contracts, teaching agreements, and also at the end of the class, generate payroll requests to go to, to HR. Okay, I should hit the right button here. Instructor fees. Um, one of the dilemmas is uh, sometimes you get into paying a preparation fee or you want to give them some mileage reimbursement uh, the miscellaneous pay description is a place where you can put in a, a description and just add a flat dollar amount for the amount of additional fee you might want to give to an instructor. Uh, instructor evaluations. Um, I'm curious, again, for those of you who are using Manager, how many of you store instructor evaluations in, in these elements here? I, 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 Sally, good. I know that uh, I don't see Riley or Minnesota in here, but good. All right, but that's uh, the, the evaluation field. Anything you store in here about the evaluations is part of the instructor's permanent record. So it does give you a great way to get a quick overview of how instructor student evaluations uh, are receiving, how the instructors are evaluating your I'll get that right. Student evaluations of the instructor, how those ratings might occur over time. Okay, we're on to the next tab, comments. Uh, registration warning message. Again, um, this is useful as if, if you've published classes and then discover after you've published the classes, printed the brochure, that there was an error in the text. You've had, or you've just had to change a class because of a schedule conflict of an instructor, put in a note there, and that will pop up on the screen when, some, somewhat, when your staff goes to enroll a student in that course. Uh, reference document. <clears throat> on the course screen, there's the ability to tie one document to the class, whether it's a syllabus, whether it's a contract for a contract class, uh, you can reference it in that f f field. Notes for the receipt. Uh, again, information that you'd want to put on the receipt that goes to the individual. Uh, it can go on the email receipt and also on a printed receipt. Uh, tickler notes. Um, there is a spot on the course screen to put in a callback date to remind you or remind a staff person to do some activity on the class. And uh, again, the callbacks are basically for that reminder. If you want to tell the coordinator, if you've got an associate who's supposed to be helping you do some work on a class, you can put in their name and a date, <clears throat> and it'll pop up in their uh, to-do list when they get into student manager. OK, uh, Lori, how are we doing? Questions, issues, things you, uh, I missed here? I think we're doing well for now. All right. Um, Callbacks, go up to callback. I, I skip back. <clears throat> Last tab on the screen, ACEWeb. And again, uh, if you don't have ACEWeb, this is not relevant for you. Uh, and in fact, you can turn it off if you care. But basically, this, of course, is the screen where you determine how this course would appear on your uh, web page uh, with ACEWeb. <clears throat> and I'm not going to get into the full details on this. Uh, there is a pretty good section in the help side of it. Um, the other thing I would note, if you have not discovered this, if you're the course setter-upper at your school program, that when you're in the system and you're setting up a class, once you've saved this class, you can hit the preview ACE Web course status page, and you're able to actually view this class in your pages how exactly it would look, which is a great way to get a quick proof to make sure you, uh, you've got all of your ducks in a row as far as the detail on the class. All right, ACEWeb Info. Uh, the supporting cast. Uh, so again, we talked about what are the other elements that relate to the course. 
One is the catalog code. Um, again, you you may if you don't have AceWeb, uh, you may or may not be using that. Uh, what, what this ties in is the ability to put in your course description for catalog export, or you put in a web description, uh, which can be HTML, uh, which, which is used on the web display. <clears throat> and again, if you missed it the first time in the new goodies, there is a new button in here called Generate HTML that allows you to type in the straight text in the top hit generate HTML, and it'll actually let you <clears throat> do some WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get, uh, uh, changing a font, putting in colors. You can embed uh, graphics, actually now link in a video uh, to your course description. And then finally, uh, you can set up prerequisites for this class. If you've got classes that you have to take level one before you take level two, etc. So that is the catalog code. Um, location record. Again, uh, student manager's course screen has a catalog or has a location conflict checker. <clears throat> That's managed through creating location records in the system. And uh, the location record has base information, um, can be building a room. I mentioned earlier this idea of split location. This is an example of a split location, location record. Uh, Non-split, they would just be one big 55 character uh, description for where the class or course or conference would be held. <clears throat> location information here would be on a confirmation form. You can put in detail for the web, uh, individual notes. Uh, actually, in 7.2 and 7.2a, we've actually got additional location information available to you. Okay, let's see how we're doing. Now we're getting, oh, the other big deal, holidays. <clears throat> Before, if you're a new user in AceWeb, and even, or in Student Manager, or even if you're uh, running AceWare uh, for a long time, you must create holidays for the term that you're going to be scheduling classes for before you start registering classes. Uh, because if you do that, student manager will respect the holidays that you set up. Uh, and again, there are some options that allow you to do location-specific holidays. Um, so again, this is something you must do yourself. We do not, I wish we did, but don't, have a way to automatically update holidays uh, what you can do is uh, actually even edit last year's holidays <clears throat> uh, for Christmas and New Year's and Thanksgiving. Uh, you do not have to keep the old holidays from the previous year. Once you've scheduled classes for a time frame, the holidays for that time frame are irrelevant. So you could just edit last year's holidays uh, to bring them up to date. Lori, any other thoughts on holidays? Good. Greg is telling me that he has entered his birthday into the demo. Is all his birthday <laughs> into the demo. No, Greg, we are not giving people off for your birthday. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's good. Okay. Special course types. One of the things I want to clarify, there's sometimes some confusion about the idea of what's a category and what's a course type. Uh, the big deal here is that category is user defined. It's to think of it as a code field you get to create for your program to help you kind of demark or to separate courses into different groups or categories. Uh, we give you typically with the default system some samples, but those are purely examples. You certainly can modify those, uh, do with them whatever you wish. You, you wish. However, uh, type is a different thing. Type is a system code. You can't change those. That's something Matthew and me and, and Stein deal with. And basically what that does is allows you to define a class and give it particular characteristics. And here they are. OK. Independent study. This is for the independent study optional module. I think uh, Northern Colorado has that. Inventory. 
<clears throat> it gives you the ability to create a class that you're just using to keep track of sales of particular items. Um, online, and again, if you've got Ace Web, this is relevant to being able to let you group your courses for online, because typically if they're an ongoing class, you don't have a beginning or end date, and that allows Ace Web to do special handling. Membership, again, you have to create a membership class if you're doing membership tracking, because this is what initiates the membership tracking process for the group, for your OLLI programs, or if you've got special member types. Open. Open is generally probably the default uh, class type for most of you. Uh, you'll note that <clears throat> you can specify the default, but I think by default, default we call them open. Pending is uh, a way to assign a category to a class that's just really kind of a purgatory or a hold status. And generally, um, if you've got coordinators who are beginning to build a class for a prospective class, but they're not even sure that it's going to be scheduled, <clears throat> in order to get a class and start to work on a budget, perhaps, you could, you could create a class, give it a number, call it pending, and you can manipulate the class uh, budget. You can begin to set up initial details. And then uh, and once it, you determine you're going to run that, <clears throat> then give it a particular category type that you can then uh, actually have available for students. Um, I'm just curious. Anybody use the pending status? Uh, raise your hand if you have people who use pending on any of your courses. <clears throat> I've uh, got, a, got a couple here. So, All right, uh, workshop classes. Uh, workshop is a, it's a big deal, <clears throat> and it allows you to track sub-events. We'll talk about more in a bit. Contract classes, again, a way to categorize a class as a contract program, primarily in reporting. There's not a lot of special handling with that. Event class, this is, again, primarily related to ACEWEB, is that if you've got an event like an evening uh, an evening with the professor, and you don't care about names, and you just want tickets to get in the door. It's in an auditorium, and uh, people buy one ticket, two tickets, three tickets. Uh, it allows you to do that online with ACEWEB, where a student uh, can enroll and say, I want five tickets for me and my four BFFs <clears throat> uh, to go to this event. Donation, again, primarily for ACEWEB, enables open entry donations, and then packaging, uh, is an optional module we're going to talk about in a second. Hmm, anything I missed there, Lori? I don't believe so. We're good. All right. It covers everything. All right. Packaging. Um, there. This is an optional module, 1400 bucks, and basically primarily of interest, well, I should say, package one type is particularly useful for uh, the tech schools and the career schools who do things like a CNA program that might have several different individual classes that make up the CNA program. <clears throat> it's a great way to help manage that process. Uh, package two is a kind of something anybody could use and allows you to actually bundle classes together and you buy the web bundle and you get course A and B and X and Y and you get those four courses at a discount. And you can enroll in the package, and enrolling in the package will automatically enroll the student in all one, two, three, four of those classes. Uh, so again, um, that is uh, that's a useful tool. A lot of people, I think, people are enjoying that. Uh, and again, there is a webinar on that under webinar archive. We've talked about that. Want to make sure we know where that is. If we go to customers, webinar archive. You with me, Lori? Uh, that under optional modules, and we'll get down to that, Op optional modules, uh, we've got uh, the BOGO uh, webinar. Okay, package one, that's packaging. Memberships, and again, the idea of memberships, one of the things to note if you're new and are setting up memberships, to go into the course preferences screen and set up how you want your membership expiration handled. And again, there is a webinar on that uh, in, the, in the webinar archive. Workshops. Uh, <clears throat> again, uh, setting up a type course as workshop. And incidentally, 
generally, if there are special handling issues, if you make the course type whatever it is, this particular button right here will change. It will transmogrify. It will transmute. It will magically become a tool that gives you some options related to the type of course you're creating. And for workshops, <clears throat> typically you'd use that for breakouts, concurrent sessions in a seminar or conference or symposium. Uh, you can do it for pre-conference, post-conference events, uh, whether it's with a conference or any kind of an activity. Uh, you can add optional fees to a workshop, and it'll, it'll track that for you. You can set maximums, and it's got a full reporting set. I'm going to actually roll into a workshop class here and show you uh, management in the Millennia Conference here. <clears throat> So this is a workshop type class. And when you set up a workshop uh, class, the workshop button gives you the ability to create these sub-events now, uh, where you can identify, you create a code, you can indicate how many hours it meets, you can set the maximum in the class, you can define the date it, uh, the workshop is, the time block it's in. There are two optional codes you can set up. And again, if you had um, an optional fee for this, maybe it was a pre-conference workshop or a post-conference golf outing and you wanted to charge fees for it, you could define a optional fee category and actually add that. And when a person enrolled in the workshop, it would add that fee to their optional fees on the registration for the program. Uh, and again, you can put in a leader. You can put in a location note. <clears throat> One of the new things that uh, Matthew added in 7.2 was the ability to email students who actually are in a sub-workshop within the course. Um, <clears throat> you could always email, or for a long time, email everybody enrolled in the course. But now the email ability allows you to do a blast email just to the one person who is in this particular workshop. OK, so that is workshops. Uh, all right, well, let's go ahead and get into a class and actually create a class and kind of go through the steps uh, as we go along. And I want to talk about the dates in here. Lori, before I get into adding a new class uh, and, and do a live example, any burning things we ought to deal with? No, I think we're all right until the end. Good enough. All right, let's get to a class. Now, uh, before we start, now, obviously, adding a new class, you've got an Add button here. Uh, there is <clears throat> a Module Course Add from here. But one of the big deals is that if you are working with classes that you've already got a class in the system and you want to create a new course, uh, you would use the clone button. We'll talk about that in a bit. We're going to just say we're going to add a brand new class. So I'm going to hit the add button. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to. This is going to be a fall class, and the course number is ACE 999. The category is an is an open. Uh, did it say just a non-credit class? It's an open class. We'll default it to be active. <clears throat> we're going to call this Chuck's. Chuck's webinar class. Chuck's webinar class. Again, a department. Uh, you can use that um, for tracking the category of the class. We're going to put in the subject code. <clears throat> it's a six-hour class, so it would be 0 0.6 CEUs, six hours minimum. Um, we'll, I'll put in a minimum of five and a maximum of 12. On the estimated enrollment, that's up to you. And I, I think I can get 10 people. <clears throat> group count, we didn't talk about group count. Uh, but let me, let me cover that Se segue now, guys. Group count is that if you've got a program where you're never, ever going to have enrollments in it, you're never going to register a name in the course, but you want to keep track that the Division of Continuing Ed at Ace Ward University held an open house uh, on the 3rd of May, and about 200 people showed up. 
that is what the group count would be used for, to kind of put in the state fair estimate of attendance uh, on a program that you never had any bona fide registrations for. <clears throat> and when you do that, there are some special reporting elements you got to watch for, but that's, that's what that's for. Okay, so we've got the group count, uh, the catalog code. Well, um, I created a catalog code, so I'm going to right mouse click and find my ACE 99 class. Uh, the account number, what is the account that this falls into, who the coordinator is, uh, Jeannie's covering me on this. Uh, the begin date, well, that course is going to be the 17th of October. Now, and it's going to be two sessions. Now, you'll note as I'm typing this in, it is automatically adjusting things based on the schedule. The start date is always checked in your days of the week. So you can't, you can't say, uh, I want to uncheck Wednesday and find it on another day. It will always be whatever, as a minimum, the start date. Now, if this class was, instead of meeting once a week every Wednesday, it was a, a Wednesday-Thursday class, you would need to click the day that that class meets if it's a sequenced class. Okay, time. It's going to be 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. So at this point, it's uh, creating the schedule. I haven't set up my room yet. I'm going to put it in the Aceware Systems World Headquarters, and I'm going to put it in the lower level. And it's asking me to update the location information. So at this point, I have scheduled a class. Um, I pretty much have everything done on this first page. You'll note that the fields across the back are dim because I haven't saved this yet. If I want to, I'm ready to go on now, I do have to click the Save button in order now to go on and complete the rest of the class. Uh, so. Additional user-defined fields. I'm not going to put anything in here. Uh, well, maybe I said I uh, Chuck. Chuck wants to know every time there's a registration for this class. So I'm going to put him as a blind carbon copy. No setup. Any setup notes? Uh, you know, Perrier for the instructor. Um, Supplies, special populations, if there was any other notes on this, we'll leave that alone for now. All right. Fees. Well, we're going to have a default none entered. We're going to do an early bird fee here. Early bird fee of $250 if they register 14 days in advance. Now, I'm going to add another main fee of the regular registration fee which was 295 and then you might add, I might say there's a staff fee for this. For some reason, staff wanted to hear Chuck speak, 230 Now, that's one, if I had AceWeb, I'd say, I'm going to hide that from the web. I don't want people to just self-select them as staff on the web. <clears throat> um, all right. Now, as you're adding fees, if you click Show All, one of the people have asked about, well, I, I want this to expire on a specific date. Well, if you do Show All now, it will actually show you what the day is 14 days in advance of when this class is scheduled. You know, I'm kind of doing a class at the last minute, and so my early bird fee would never occur for anybody. Eh, leave that alone. <clears throat> Optional fees. Uh, again, add-on, optional fees. I'm going to add a, a book here, or calculator, and we'll say that's a $10 fee, and that is just a standard other fee. It's not mandatory, and we don't want to hide it from the web. So again, this is where you'd be able to put discounts, coupon code fees, and there is, again, help in the section to, to go about doing that. Instructors. Um, well, I guess if Chuck's teaching that, we're assuming he's going to be the instructor. Now, when you create, and, and we talked about instructors, so we're going to segue here. Um, 
Chuck is already set up in my database as an instructor. Now, that's obviously one of the big, big fields, and I should have had it on the PowerPoint, as an additional um, element of the course screen is that you've got to create instructor records before you can add them as instructors to the class. Um, and the instructor record can be created from the name record. Uh, I'm going to go to my help button, see if I can get my F1 key to come up. Alt-Y, create an instructor from a name. So if you go to a name record, press Alt-Y, you can actually create a record in the instructor table from the name record that you happen to be sitting on. Uh, but I already, have, I already have Chuck in the system here. One of the things that you can, and I would recommend also do, is again, make sure the availability days are set up the way you want. You can indicate their payment status, what level of access that you want them to be able to see if you have ACEWEB. And then, in additional info, you can set up payment type and the payment rate that is the normal pay schedule for this instructor. This is an example we mentioned about a validated user-defined field um, so that you have to, in my demo, you have to pick one of these different categories per class C, F flat fee, G percent of gross, et cetera, et cetera. And so if Chuck's standard rate is 50 bucks an hour, you could put that on his record. And then when you add him to a class, that automatically flows into the class. Um, and of course, once you add them to the class, you can change it. You said, well, wait a minute. This time we've negotiated with Chuck that he's going to get a per student rate of 10 bucks. You really got him talked down. <clears throat> so that his, his, uh, his calculation for pay will be the number of enrollments times 10 bucks. And that will be his pay schedule. And then these were those user-defined fields for tracking the score at the end of the class. All right, uh, I'm going to go on to comments. No registration warning message right now, because we're just building the class. Uh, reference document. Uh, if we had a descriptor or a syllabus, we could put that in there. Note for the receipt, uh, bring a, an apple for the teacher. You know, this is silly. But things like wear loose fitting clothes for a dance class, non-marking soles for the dance class, bring your hard hat, bring steel-toed shoes to the welding class, uh, supply list, that's the kind of stuff that you put in the note. And then again, reminder note, if you wanted to remind to order the Perrier water, and we wanted to have the assistant here, Rosie, order that um, the Monday before the class starts, uh, we could do that. And then, of course, finally, turning on the email reminder to the student, which, by the way, is a big deal. Uh, and that is something that uh, I thought that was an automatic preference, but I guess you have to, you have to enable that on a per-class basis. All right, then finally, uh, setting up the class ACE Web. If this class was a class that was, or if you, your program has ACE Web, this would be where you'd put in the, uh, get the link, and you'd be able to actually see what this class would look like online. And then, of course, you'd put in your, your published property, publish, register, allow billing. <clears throat> number of lag days, how many days it stays open, days to stay open for billing, merchant account if it's other, if it's class by class. Uh, so that is the basics of adding a new class. And I don't know if there's any, we're, we're, we're doing pretty good. We should be able to be done in a minute. You want to do any questions now or you want to wait till the end? I'd like to wait till the end. All right. So that is, we've gone through the big piece. Uh, we'll come back to that in a second here on a couple of these other areas. <clears throat> okay, special buttons and fields. We're kind of back to the general aspect of, cre of class creation. Number one is room use, special handling. Um, and again, um, the oftentimes, I don't know oftentimes, sometimes you get into a case where you've scheduled a room, a certain schedule, and you have to change it. Uh, the second day the class meets, that room is unavailable. 
Well, you can modify that through the use of, uh, through hitting the room use um, pop-up. Uh, that brings up the day of the class, the start hour in military time, end hour, end minutes, the session time, and the location. Well, if we said, well, wait a minute, on the second day, we need to move the time back, and we're going to have to change the location. Well, what you do is you, you just edit the time. Instead of 1,900, it's going to be uh, 1,800 hours. End at 2,100, and you'll note it automatically updated the time. And instead of at ASWARE, when I tab into the location field, I'm going to have to move it from the lower level to the green room. So I can change the, and again, I could have changed the date. <clears throat> if I said, well, we need to change the date altogether, we need to move it to the following Wednesday, uh, you could do that by just editing the actual date. Uh, so again, uh, tremendous amount of flexibility in being able to let you uh, modify these particular dates for individual class sessions within a course. And again, I do control F4 to save, <clears throat> and now I've got that uh, room use set up. Now, one of the things to note, I've customized the room use at this point. I'm going to go prior next and get back to it. This is the customized room use for this class. If you set up a customized room use and then go back, modify any of the base elements on this class, it will overwrite your custom room use unless, okay, stay with me, unless you go into preferences and you go into warn, uh, there's a d -d 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 clone reg, warn, here it is, warn on time location change. So if you do a lot of custom room use scheduling and you end up accidentally overriding that, you want to go into course preferences and check the box that says warn on time location change. Because that will warn you if you're trying to change a course that it will wipe out <clears throat> any custom room use setup that you've done on a class. All right, Lori, uh, can I keep on going? Yeah. All right. So let's get back to wrong one, kids. Stay with me. Slideshow. Here we go. So that is the room use button. Uh, grouping codes. Uh, again, big, big deal uh, for AceWeb, uh, also for tracking certificate programs. And I didn't do that in my course example, but uh, if this was a class that I had on the web, I need to make sure that we added a <clears throat> code to it that would show up for AceWeb display. I can also use it to determine certificate program groups. If this webinar class was going to be one of several classes in the um, ACEWARE user certificate group, then I would add the ACE certificate code to it, and then I'd be able to use this class in doing our special reports under uh, transcript reporting for certificate completion in an area. <clears throat> and Lori, that's probably a topic we'll want to revisit sometime this year in our webinar series. I think we've got one in the history, but it's it's a little bit dated. Yeah. All right, so that is the grouping code. Real quickly, uh, where that gets you to is that in the uh, I picked the wrong one. Let me get to it. In the ACE Web display, when we're looking at classes groups, the group that we put in. The class is where a course will appear under the course schedule that students are going to your website <clears throat> to look for classes. All right, that's the grouping codes. You're so add. Behind you, Chuck. I'm sorry. I said your screen is a little bit behind. Okay, you, uh, you with me? That registration access. At the moment, it's black. I don't know what happened. Well, I was bouncing. Let's wait just a second and see if you're with me now. Okay, grouping codes of the web and more. Oh, okay. goodness. You're way... Because um, I rolled to...
to the website, two or three websites, it might be trying to refresh. Let's 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 let everybody catch okay, up. Okay, now I'm going to add edit Reggie's. Okay, fine. Okay, sorry about that. I was flying a bit helter skelter. Uh, the add edit Reggie's button allows you to add registrations right from the screen. Um, again, if you're doing grouping of multiple people in a class, you've got five people that you want to register in one class, and when you group them together. Coming into Add Edit Reggie is a good way to do that because it'll prompt you automatically to group the registrations together, uh, and it's a good way to edit existing registrations. If for some reason you need to go in and deal with all the registrations in one course, <clears throat> you can go into here and then just skip uh, registration to registration to registration among all the registrations in the course. And we'll talk about more this. We'll talk about more of this in, in next week's registration uh, webinar. Uh, budget and pocket ledger. Again, there are there are modules on that. For those of you that are new to the system and maybe haven't explored this, the beauty of the budget tool is that it allows you to put in your estimated fees. We're going to update the fees. Nope, nope. Import the fees. That's what we want. You with me now on budget records, Lori? Yes. Okay. You put in the number of people you think you're going to get. You add your per person expenses like supplies, the lunch you're going to include, the coffee breaks you're going to provide, Chuck's Perrier water that he's going to, let's say, give everybody in the class a bottle of Perrier, and then put in the expenses of the estimated instruction, room rental, marketing, advertising, and it'll basically generate your go, no, go number and break even number. So again, um, a great tool uh, for uh, Estimating a budget pocket ledger is then the backside of the budget builder in that is where you can actually track. And again, this is typically skunk works. You still have to deal with your accounting system, whether it's the local QuickBooks or the campus's financial record system, to put in requisitions and POs. But this allows you to actually allocate expenses to an individual class and then be able to do your profit and loss uh, kind of reporting. Um, pocket Ledger, clone the course. We talked about cloning the class, uh, that if we were running a second section of a class we had done before, you, you should never create it from scratch if it's been in the system before. And that's what the clone course allows you to do. Uh, and again, by, by way of review, uh, in the preferences area on the class, <clears throat> you've got several kind of options as to how you might want to deal with cloning. Do you want to clone the instructors? Do you want to clone the instructor pay note? Do you want to clone user-defined fields? Do you want to clone the registration warning message? So again, depending on how you run, how you use the system, you can change a preference on a number. Uh, you can change a preference on a number of those items. Student list, uh, quick view of registrations. One of the things I want to make sure that we cover, and let's get back to a class with enrollments, that if you have the ability to edit student registrations, and you go to student list, you can actually edit the registration note, the registration code. You can edit the miscellaneous note, the hours, and the credits, and the grades. So I could go in with my class list and go through the list here and say, Lisa Avery gets a B. Obama gets a C because he's been on the road. He only attended 10 hours of this class. So he's not going to get the full credit. Um, Willard Romney gets a C as well. He also has been traveling around the country, not participating in the class as much. Adam gets an A, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, you can add grades, edit this core data about the registration performance right from the student roster screen, close this, and if you look at the upper right-hand corner of my screen, it'll said four records updated. And it will automatically add those changes to the registration data. There's Willard Romney. He gets a C, and he only gets 10 hours of participation credit. I didn't have to go into individual records to do that. 
Okay, spreadsheet view, attendance. Attendance tracking, it's an optional module. Uh, again, not going to be able to cover that in detail today. Uh, I think we've got a webinar on that in the history. There's a good section in the help about that. So I'm going to leave that for your continued education. How's that? Uh, mass register. Uh, this, is, this is pretty cool. Again, <clears throat> allows you to think of it as a, um, what do you say, promotion. Second grade to third grade promotion is that if you've got sequence classes that typically everybody from level two will be enrolling in level three, it allows you to mass enroll a whole class into another class. Uh, and yet still have the ability to uh, take out people who have wigged out uh, Millard and, and Barack who are not going to be available next term, or maybe only one of them will be available next term, so we'll uh, take out the one that doesn't make it uh, when we go in to do the mass register for the next go-round. Okay, course quick reports. Um, we would not, uh, we've got to talk about reporting on the courses here, is that Quick reports, again, a wonderful tool. And a couple of things about it I want to get to the live system to reference. <clears throat> First of all, um, it remembers. Quick reports remembers the last preferences that you made when the last time you went in to run reports. Um, what's new, and this is again in 7.2a, is that on attendance rosters, you have the ability for classes that meet multiple weeks or multiple months to be able to do splits by week one, week two, week three, months, month one, month two, month three. So you could run one roster per week rather than printing them all at the same time and trying to remember to save them in a file somewhere week six of the seven-week class. Uh, on things like uh, name tags and mailing labels, you have the ability to say set the starting label. So if you've got a printed sheet of four name tags printed off a six name tag sheet, you can say set the starting label, <clears throat> and I'm going to say I want to set at label number three, and what it'll do is generate down the list, skip one, skip two, skip three, and start actually start at label number three, four, five, six, seven. So you can recycle partially used pieces of a um, name tag or mailing labels. Um, other tools, email a quick roster to the class, email um, a roster to instructor, quick email to class, check special needs. And this is nice if, if right before you run the class you say, well, is there anybody in here with special needs? Well. Uh, this Barack guy is asking for his stimulus check, but you know, handicapped, handicapped, wheelchair bound, hearing aid impaired, altitude um, affected, uh, whatever his special needs might be. All right, uh, quick reports. Insider info, we're just about ready for Q&A, guys, so keep those questions coming. We're going to get to them. Online help, again, cannot say enough about this. Uh, we've covered this in 60 minutes. Uh, you probably need to spend three to four hours working on courses, testing, doing some research, creating sample courses in the demo to really honestly get proficient with that. And your online help is going to be your guide. Um, and uh, by example here, uh, if we go to the help guide, and I'm in the help guide right now, the new search mode at the top. So if I were to say uh, course type, and I say I want to search within the courses area for course type, because I want to study that more, what Chuck was talking about for course type, it'll search through the system, give you all the links to course type in the system, waiting for help. Uh, I have it set up. Are you there, Lori? Details? Says it returned results. There they are. Okay. There they are. Okay. Course type. So again, that's what the help guide is able to do. You can search, find a particular area, and go in and look at that in more detail. All right. Online help. 
special course admin tools. And again, real quickly, this is where I'm going to send you to the help guide. But uh, the mass update delete for like deactivating courses, that's where that is. Mass deleting courses, if there's some reason you need to do a whole batch of classes, there is a procedure to deal with canceling an entire class. If you've got an instructor who's gotten ill and you've had to cancel the entire class, how to, how to deal with that. Transporting has to do with the Road Warrior, which is a separate component. Check it out in the help. Mass registration transfer. Now, that's what I want to kind of uh, reference you here, and actually I can do it via the help because I have it up. Mass registration transfer should be in. There it is, mass transfer tool. <clears throat> what this allows you to, now you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. What this allows you to do, if you for some reason have errantly made a mistake, or you're changing a course and you want to move everybody who is already registered in one class to a different class. And again, this is a transfer. This isn't leaving them and, move, and leaving them in one class and, and to the other. Is that you can use the mass transfer tool. One possible use. You had five people in one section of a class that you've had to cancel, but you opened a new section and you've talked to them all, and they all are happy to transfer to the new section. That's a great use of the mass transfer tool. All right. Think of any others for that, Laurie, that you've run into? Uh, no. I think no? that's a good idea. All right. Uh, and again, for reporting, reporting tools in the course side, the F2 key, which is the upcoming class or the quick enrollment count, and the control F2, which is the room use, showing you what rooms are in use. Um, again, I'm going to have you raise your hand. Raise your hand if you have used either F2 or control F2 in the last month. Raise your hand. Let me, show me. Show me that you love that F2 key. Yes, we've got folks doing that. So that's great. See? Keep people awake. Guys, oh, and then last, we, the example of the mass clone, and we talked about that for uh, at one of the tools in the course tool set. Uh, then the final, and that almost final piece is don't want to forget that you can change the sort order if you're looking at your classes. And this is where I want to go to live. If you say, I'm looking at my classes, the normal sort order, that is when you go this, next or prior, is course number. So we're at 12S010A. Next, 12SA10B. Next, ACE101. Next, ACE102. Well, okay, well, maybe I wanted to see by date. I want to know by begin date what the order is. So now I'm at 11.5, and now I'm at 11.1. Uh, 1025, 1025, 1024, 1027, and again, so that sort button allows you to temporarily, there isn't a way to lock that down, it always resets to course number. <coughs> uh, a title, you say, well, let's say maybe I wanted to look at all of the management conferences together. Well, if I were to put it by title, then I can say management in the millennia, next, whoops, Next, management in the millennia. Next, mastering student manager. Next, mastering student manager 7-1, et cetera, et cetera. So again, uh, a nice way for you to be able to navigate through when you're looking at checking records uh, uh, of courses that you've already set up. And with that, Lori, we are, OK, 70, OK, we've got 20 minutes for questions. so. Good luck. Fire away. Sort through and tell me what we got. <laughs> a bunch of questions about that active button. I, people just really get tripped up about that, don't they? <laughs> OK. What's the gist of those? Any... I can still see a course that is inactive. Absolutely. And again, guys, I don't know how much, what else I can tell you. The only thing the active button does is determines whether this course shows up when you're at a registration, when you're at a name record. 
when you're on a name record and you say add registrations for this name in student manager, then the only classes that appear in here are classes that are marked as active <clears throat> for reporting, for lookup. Uh, if, if I wanted to run a report on a class, if I wanted to go look up a class, active has nothing to do with it. Now, say with that one again, because people are also asking about how active affects reporting. That was my not a, da that not a dadgum bit. So <laughs> uh, unless you specify active as a filter or a query criteria, active courses will appear active, inactive, will show up in any kind of course listing that you have as long as you didn't specifically exclude or include a particular category in, in creating, whoa, hang on a second, uh, let's, let me get courses, CE reporting. Unless you created a query that specifically said active is true or active is false, uh, if I pick course number, I'm going to get every 12 class whether it's active or not. So again, do not attribute any magical prowess to the active button. And again, the only other thing is that there is a new lookup option that if you're doing fine. Now, I'm going to do fine regular, and I see every flipping course in the system. If I were to go to module courses, find active, now it's only going to show me the classes that are marked active. And it's just another way for you to look up. But that's the only place, the find button and in the add new registrations for a person is where the active code hides things. All right? Yay. Yay. <laughs> Early on, Marissa and I had a, a short conversation about whether it would be better to scan evaluations and save it as a reference document, or whether it would be better to collate the results and post them at the bottom of the instructor. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it, if you've got the ability to do summary ratings through the use of SurveyMonkey or Zoomerang, and you, you, can, you can create a numeric value from 1 to uh, 100, I would encourage you to go ahead and do the effort to put them in here. Because when you're at an instructor record, you can go into the instructor record, look at courses taught history, past courses, and it'll show you all of the rating elements that that instructor has in their history. So this would let you see that Chuck's ratings are going from 9998877. You can say, hey, Havlicek, you're slacking off. You don't step it up. We're going to find a new instructor for this class. Uh, now, obviously, uh, there isn't the ability in this particular screen to store qualitative. You know, the uh, student comments like, this is the best instructor since sliced bread. You can't turn that into a number. And that's where uh, a summary of evaluations, a PDF of the, of the narrative results might be, you could use that in the document. It kind of depends on, again, how, uh, how you use it, how much detail you store. And, and it, it's like anything else, how much effort you're willing to put into it in terms of using that to, to help you improve your program. Very good. Thank you. Uh, can you go back through the email reminder? Email reminder, uh, again, now a, a couple of things about that. Uh, number one, <clears throat> there is email student reminders as an option under tools. You have to set it up under preferences. And under course, there is an option here that says, whoa, give me my pointer here email course reminders X number of days before the begin date. So number one, you have to turn that on. You'll note it's a black preference, which means that if you've got multiple people in your office, you can de decide which staff members you want to kind of task with watching for the email reminder element. So you, you, you do that. And then what you have to do <clears throat> is to as you're creating new classes, make sure that you have the tick email reminders to students. I need to check with Matthew whether or not that defaults to a true 
when you have the preference set up. I'm hoping it does. If not, it will before the end of the day. So that in other words, if your preference here is on, that we want to make sure that if you're creating a new course, that uh, that particular course is going to have the email. Did, did you guys stay with me on my bouncing around? Are you? I, I was hitting a number of screens. Yeah, we got slow in the middle, but we're caught up now. OK. Uh, but this is the big deal is where you check that. Now, if you, you say, well, what to do again? When you have it on, when you log in, if you're the person who has that turned on, and you log in, and there are classes upcoming that have not gotten an email reminder note, uh, no email reminder set up. <clears throat> Let me find somebody in the class. This is something I do want to cover because 10, two, 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 get somebody in a class. Management in the Millennia Conference. Uh, I don't have anybody. Hang on a second. I'm going to sort this by begin date. I'm going to go back. And uh, here's one. I'm going to turn on the reminder. OK, I think this should work now. All right, you with me? Main screen. Yes. OK. Email reminders. It'll bring up a list of classes that would be coming up in the next eight days or that you haven't sent reminders to with a note to say, do you want to include that? So you say, done. Ah, I don't have the module in the demo. It would bring you a mass email tool that lets you send out a reminder note, a personal note to everybody in the class saying your class is coming up in the next x days. Be there or be square. All right. Okay. So, And, and again, there is, uh, I think we, well, anyway. Um, if you got questions on that, check with your tech. But yes, that is a great feature. If you're not using it, boy, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. OK. Uh, can you show an example of cloning a course? We had a yeah. couple of people wanted to see that. Now, let's go in. Let's say that Tablet Check course on uh, <clears throat> 9999. You, you think that's going to be so popular, we're going to need to open up a new section of that class. So. Rather than doing add and creating all that stuff again, we're going to click clone course. It says enter the new course number. Well, what my recommendation is, if you're following the similar model here, uh, you would press Alt F1 to paste in the old course number, but you've got to change it. So we're going to call this section B. Hit the OK button. And now I'm in a new record. Everything is carried over from the last class except the dates. Well, we're going to put this in 11, 11 12 Whoops, Sunday. We don't want it on Sunday. 11 12 Monday, and we're going to make it a Monday and a Wednesday class. Now, if nothing else changes, I'm OK with the location. The fees are the same. I'm done. You have created a second section of this class with only three entries in the system. So again, it is slicker than snot to roll out multiple copies of the same course. <clears throat> All right? All right. Uh, group count. Group count. Uh, yeah, what about group wanting count? wanting to know, does it report? Uh, how, do, how does it like impact? I said, yeah, it, 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 normally, no, and again, this is this is where I said if you're going to use group count, or you say, you know, I could use that, you have to create a special report. Uh, there is actually a function in the student manager, uh, student manager topics. I'm at the help guide now. Are you with me? Not yet. There we are. OK, I'm at the help guide. I'm going to click Student Manager Topics. And I'm slow on mine here. But, 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 but. Come on, come on, Student Manager Topics. Here we go. Uh, now, do you see the drop down under Student Manager Topics? Yes. Report functions. I believe there is one called Group Count. Group, 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 group count. Now that I'm looking for that, and now this is where I'm going to actually go to my help guide, because I'm not sure where it is. Group count. 
<clears throat> and I'm going to say in functions, and I'm going to search for that. And here it is. Uh, here it is, best enroll. That's a good name for it. What best enroll you'd have if you're going to use group count, you would need to modify your report. And this is, again, if you're not sure about this, you could certainly get with your tech. <clears throat> but that if you're going to use group count, you have to use best enroll because best enroll then will follow the rule that if a course has a group count number and there is no actual enrollment number, it will put on the report for you the number from the group count field rather than the number from the enrolled field. So again, that is called, that again was best enroll and that is in the help guide under functions. All righty. Um, what's the best way to handle a course that meets in two different locations? Uh, I assume not at the same time, but again, back to the idea of the room use, so that if the first class is at the Aceware World Headquarters, but the second class is at the Carnival Cruise Line, we love that, you just click into the location field and uh, put the location in the detail. Now, Obviously, what you would also want to do, and this would be a good example, would be in the registration warning message, say, note, second class on board the boat. Second class meets on board the boat. You know, So you'd want to put a note in the warning message to so make sure that the students are aware or that the staff would tell the student notes for their seat, bring an apple for the teacher, reminder, and then you'd probably want to do this uh, second, second class session is at wherever it's going to be. <clears throat> so you'd kind of put, this is for the staff, so the staff are, make sure to remind students if they're talking to them on the phone, you'd want to put it in their confirmation to indicate where a class session is held. All right? Uh, is there an import tool for Pocket Ledger? No. I, I, it's a quick question. Uh, we do not have an import for Pocket Ledger. Now, if you've got a batch of records that you want to bring over <clears throat> and you want to start using Pocket Ledger, get with your tech. We could probably do a quick you know, $50 import or uh, show you a quick way to import those in, but there isn't a tool wizard uh, per se to do that. Okay, folks, I'm almost to the bottom of my question, so if you that have any good. remaining and I haven't asked, you need to put them in again because there's been a lot of chatter today. Um, where do you find the email template uh, or the email reminder? Okay, um, under module catalog email templates. Uh, our email templates, uh, we actually piggyback on the catalog system, so <clears throat> if we do the email reminder, course reminder, oops, that's wrong one. Let me find that course reminder. Here it is, reminder. So uh, this is the default template. Thank you for participating in our courses, kind of a lead paragraph. The email body is uh, the course that they are enrolled in and the day and the time. And then the footer is the... Uh, the hugs, hugs, kisses, questions, who do you call, um, as part of the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the email body. It's called Reminder is the default for the course reminder. Well, I think we have reached the bottom of the list of questions. Not the bottom. We, we have reached the curtain call almost. So again, <laughs> uh, guys, you got four and a half minutes. Any questions that you asked that Lori has overlooked because she's been so busy trying to respond to all the text, <clears throat> bring it back up in the, so it shows up in her top of her uh, important file stuff. Yeah, I'm going to need a manicure after all this <laughs> typing. <laughs> uh, while people are typing, I'm going to t remind them, this is the F2 key, a quick list of enrollments. 
to me, it is the handiest tool. Uh, and again, say you're in the middle of working with somebody and you're putting in notes. Boss person comes in and says, what's the class next week on blah, blah? Well, rather than leaving the name record, having to go run a report, press F2. And you can say, show me 10 days out upcoming classes. Hit the OK button and say, well, Ms. Boss, here are the two classes. And what do you want to know? Who's the instructor? Have a check. How many enrolled? Zero, zero. Uh, OK, thank you. Go away. And now once you leave that, you're right back to what you were doing before. So again, F2, great tool. Hope you use it. Any other questions that have come in? Everybody tired? It's time for lunch. Yes. Yes, more? Blow the whistle, we're done. Blow the whistle. <laughs> Lori, thank you so much. Uh, excellent job of navigating the process. Again, remember, next week, same time, Wednesday, 1030 Central, uh, for registrations. We're going to try to get through that in 60 minutes. It might run a little longer, so don't, don't schedule something real tight to that. Uh, but we'll aim for 60, and we'll keep you on the road to student manager perfect knowledge. How's that, Lori? Sounds good. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.